thank you, Rich, very, very much. And um, it's very lovely to be back with uh, the oldies. I suppose I'm an oldie myself as well, so, but at the oldie lunch. The only drawback, I think, of um, being an author at the oldie lunch is that the books get signed before lunch and before you've had a chance to get drunk. <laughs> In my experience, sober people think before they buy. <laughs> I don't want you to think, I want you to buy. And I think there are a few copies of my book left. It's a beautiful object. I had some difficulty, I have to admit, persuading any English publisher that um, Dante was worth knowing about or writing about. When I confessed this to Mark Lawson, who does the front row show on the radio, he said, well, he was thinking of a title, which is a selling title. <coughs> Something like Dante and how to get your child into a good state primary school. <laughs> Dante and Nigella's favorite recipes, or something of that kind. I stuck to Dante in love. I thought if I put love in the title, it might give the misleading impression that the book was a romance. But of course it is of a, of a romantic character. And Dante is one of those figures who totally dominate European culture and used to be much more widely read in this country than he is now. An awful lot of things that we think of, however, as just being in the atmosphere, really derive from him, including, of course, our ideas of uh, hell, purgatory, and heaven, many of which don't really come from church so much as they come from his great poem, The Divine Comedy. It's partly because uh, called a comedy because it is actually very funny. It is a satire. Um, it was charming before lunch to meet two friends that I hadn't seen for over 20 years who ran the British Council in Turkey, and um, Christine and Michael Wilson. And um, they reminded me of my journey for the British Council through the universities of Turkey. I was talking about satire, not a subject I know very much about actually, as they discovered, but um, I was with an expert on Dean Swift, so that covered that, and I was meant to do the modern stuff. And so I told them all about Richard Ingram's. <laughs> and Private Eye, and Spitting Image, which was very popular in those days. It was perfectly all right in Ankara, and it was mainly all right in Istanbul. It was on the last night, the British consul in Istanbul came and listened to my talk. I don't know if you remember this, Christine. He was, funnily enough, the brother of somebody who was a great friend of the old, Jennifer Patterson, who was uh, famous as one of the two fat ladies on telly. He got up to his feet after I'd been telling them how marvellously funny a private life was, uh, which it was in those days, and, uh, <laughs> and um, all about the spitting image puppets of the Queen and uh, Mrs. Thatcher dressed as a kind of sadomasochistic man in a leather cat and so forth. And James Patterson got up and said, I'd just like you to know that most people in England profoundly disagree with what Mr. Wilson has been saying. <laughs> they think of these things, so-called satire movement, as a kind of poison or cancer in our midst. And I would like you to know that I consider Richard Ingrams one of the most dangerous people in the United Kingdom. <laughs> I didn't disillusion the term, <laughs> but he probably still is very famous. But I, so many of our ideas, and even our jokes about the afterlife, um, come from Dante. I mean, I was, somebody was telling me not brilliantly funny joke the other day, and I just thought, in a way, this is just a modern version. It was about American presidents, and George W. Bush dies and goes to hell, of course. And he's shown round by the devil, he's told that he has a choice as he goes into these various horrific torture chambers designed for dead Americans. Um, <laughs> he's shown President Truman being tortured for dropping atomic bombs on the Japanese. Uh, he's shown into another room where LBJ is suffering all the effects of napalm bombing which he'd inflicted on the Vietnamese. And he's shown an uh, equally horrible place full of snakes and rats and poison uh, where Nixon is being tortured. 
And then he's shown a room which looks to him perfectly agreeable. It's got um, President Clinton in it. Having the most, uh, well, we were in very polite company, so I won't say what's happening to him, but Monica Lewinsky <laughs> is sitting beside him, or leaning beside him, perhaps, would be more accurate. <laughs> doing the most appalling and graphic things. And uh, President Bush is given the choice which of these four terrible torture chambers he's going to enter. And he said, well, I think on the whole I shall go to the um, one with President Clinton. So the devil opened the door and said, right, Monica, you've suffered enough. <laughs> I've, I've brought your replacement. The Dantean tale, isn't it? <laughs> and the Inferno is full of stories of that kind. And indeed, the Paradiso has quite a lot of good jokes. And um, somebody tell me another very sort of weird, I don't want to offend Bob Marshall Andrew, but story about uh, a young couple, a Catholic couple, they were just about to get married and they were both run over. And they arrived at the pearly gates. They said to St. Peter, we were feeling rather disappointed, because although we're still together, we never actually tied the knot. Would it be possible, do you think, in the whole of heaven to make arrangements? We could perhaps get married when we're up here. And he said, well, it's very strange. I don't think I've ever had that request before. But who knows? Just wait around here. I'll go and see what I can do. So they waited around, and they listened to heavenly music, and they ate a lot of lovely things. Kept looking at their watch, no sign of St. Peter. The woman said, you know, it is very nice here, but what happens if after a few years together, like a lot of people are rather unfortunately, we decided we didn't want to be married after all? What happens if we decided we wanted to get a divorce? He said, well, I'm sure we won't, but when he comes back, he has been gone an awfully long time there, St. Peter. When he comes back, we'll ask him. And uh, they waited and they waited and they waited. They waited for three months. And when St. Peter came back, they said, um, is it all right about getting married? And he said, well, I mean, it has been quite difficult, but yes, it will be all right. You can get married. Because he said, while you were away, we were wondering about whether it would be possible also, if the marriage doesn't work out, to get a divorce. And St. Peter said, it's taken me three months searching this place to find a priest. Where the bloody hell do you think I'm going to find a lawyer? In <laughs> with which I'm sure Dante would have been very much in agreement. <laughs> anyway, I mustn't keep you. Uh, you but um, don't forget, those of you who've still got money in your pocket, there's a beautiful book over there, um, wonderfully produced. It would look lovely on your coffee tables if you're not reading types. <laughs> and if you are, uh, give that book to any grandchild or child, and they'll get into university, they'll get their PhD. Um, and it will make their career. So I urge you to buy my humble wares. <laughs>